Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Open Mic, Writers in Their Own Words, where every show I talk to writers about their work, the publishing industry, and how they do what they do. The show is available by the same name on both YouTube and via all of the major podcast platforms. You can subscribe to either or both, which is, of course, my preference, so hopefully you never miss a thing. Uh, now my guest today is one of the true stars in modern crime fiction. He's the author of the best-selling Rick Cahill series, which features the exploits of the title character, a former cop turned PI, who often finds himself sparring with the law as much as he does with criminals. His work has been called uh, gritty, emotionally wrenching, uh, hard-boiled. Uh, I concur with all that. His latest Cahill book, Odyssey's End, comes out on the day we are recording this, Tuesday, November 14th. Uh, that title sounds like it might be a series finale, but uh, we'll hear if that's so from the man himself here just soon enough. Uh, Matt Coyle, welcome to the open mic. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Really a pleasure to be here. Oh, my pleasure is definitely all mine. Uh, well, as I noted, today is publication day. Now, by the time folks are, are watching this, it'll uh, pass a little bit, but publication day is always a very big day for authors, whether it's the first one or the 10th one. Uh, so let's talk about Odyssey's End. Tell us a little bit about the book. Well, it's uh, Rick Cahill, as you described, is a private investigator. He's, uh, this is not a um, spoiler, it's book three, that is book 10, but it's book three where he's had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the uh, brain trauma disease that's not going to go away. When I gave it to him in Last Redemption, I realized that it was... Um, in some ways, a death sentence, or at least um, something that, you know, couldn't be gone. The next book couldn't miraculously disappear. So he's battling that. And uh, due to some of the symptoms that do really happen in this disease, um, first of all, the disclaimer is, as far as I know right now, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy can only be really diagnosed after death. But they can pre-diagnose it and they're probably getting better and better. And as a matter of fact, unfortunately, I have a friend who's been pre-diagnosed with it. Um, comes from brain traumas mentioned a life of Rick's has lived a life of violence. It, it, I mean, not necessarily malicious violence, but he boxed. He was a, uh, he played football from, he boxed golden gloves, played football from Pop Warner through two years of college, um, was a cop. He's had concussions that are private investigator. So kind of made sense he would get this. So he has that, he's still battling it, but it's kind of some of the symptoms has created a rift between he and his wife who has taken her, their daughter up to Santa Barbara. Rick is in San Diego. Um, she's frustrated with him taking cases where he risks his life at times, um, but he kind of can't walk away from trying to help people even as he his family's foremost in his mind. Complicated guy, a little messed up. And in, in this book, someone from his past re-enters his life and with an offer that he can't refuse and someone he doesn't trust, someone who's eh, actually tried to kill him once. I mean, that happens to everybody. Um, but someone actually saved his life once too. So, uh, but it's also a potential for him to have an, uh, a significant jump to the nest egg he's trying to build for his daughter. Because he knows he's got this disease. Whatever happens, his life lifeline is probably shortened quite a bit. And if he's not going to be there, he wants to leave at least something behind when not, life knocks her down. So a lot of danger ensues. And bad decisions by Rick, as always. <laughs> well, you know, when you've been with a character as long as you've been with this one, you know, I, I, I hearken back, Paul Levine was on the show a while back and he was just bringing the end to his Jake Lasseter series. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, I asked him about that whole scenario. You know, he'd been writing Jake Lasseter books for decades. And, you know, it, I'm always curious when you put your character in a situation where, the, like, as you know, there is no cure for CTE. The, the end is always the same. And you had to think about that a little bit. Did you, was it a process for you to reconcile that, you know, this is an irrevocable step I'm taking here with this, with this plot line and it's got an inevitable end. Am I okay with that? 
Yeah, so I thought about it quite a bit. Uh, I mean, it, it would turn. It was a great hook for an ending of a book, of course. So, so it was, I, I couldn't escape that. But yeah, I thought a lot about it. And but I also I had two roles when I when I started writing twenty years ago. I, it took me ten years to get published, but I've been writing first person in Rick Cahill's head for twenty years. Um, and one rule was no sidekicks for Rick, no um, Superman sidekicks, no comedic sidekicks to lighten things and no necessarily wealthy sidekicks could bail them out of certain situations. I dropped that when I met more more McFarlane in book two and realized that I had to have her in the series. She's a private investigator who she and Rick have kind of a um, brother, sister, older sister, younger brother uh, relationship. And the other one that, Thank goodness I broke that rule because I don't think the series would have gone as long as it has. But the other one was everything had to matter. Every every bad mis bad decision Rick made had to have repercussions. And the same, so he's got a lot of emotional scars, which you he may act out, but you don't necessarily see. But also all the physical tra traumas he endured had to be real. He couldn't he couldn't get shot in the arm in ch chapter one and then be pitching batting practice for the Padres in chapter five. Um, the scars remain, the, the, the damage it does to his body remains. And I realized if I was going to be true to this, I started to think about all the, all the things he'd gone through, all the times he'd had to head trauma. I thought, well, and I think personally um, that a lot of people probably have CT that don't know it. Um, I think it's not just concussions. It's, it's brain. It's, you know, a lot of knocks to the head. It doesn't just have to be a concussion that, can add to this. So I think there's probably a lot of us walking around that may have it. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm going to be true to the, I'm really going to be true to this, then I'm going to give him CTE. Uh, and then I had to write the next book. So uh, <laughs> that was, uh, that's been challenging and trying to give nuance to this disease. It's not just all about him dealing with this disease. It's like the last book. It's this symptom that really can happen in real life that created a huge rift between he and his wife and among other things. So that's been the challenge for that. And having been that as you continue, I know people may pick it up. Oh, this guy is CTE. This is book 10. You know, I can't be continually dwelling on the disease uh, because, you know, people have been reading all along. So it's kind of a delicate balance. You want to have a little bit of it, but not hammer it home with each book, but it's certainly always um, in the, in the background at the minimum. Well, you know, I I really admire actually the 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 mindset of of showing the cost of violence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you write crime fiction, unless you're writing cozies, um, there's usually a lot of violence. There's mayhem. It's you know, it is what it is. And I think it's unsettling for me as a reader or a viewer of of um, you know television or movies when a as you noted, that's a great example. A character gets shot early on. And then, you know, a couple of scenes later, they're they're out there, you know, like rustling a grizzly bear. And you're just like, you know, that is not how that works. And so I actually really admire the 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 the, the whole idea of showing this cost. And you've chosen to do it this way, but I'm sure there's others too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um that isn't something like I know you see all that often. And so what was the thought, I guess, behind that of saying, I have to be real with this? Was it something that was a real, you know, that, you know, how did you come to that decision and then be able to stick with it? Yeah. Well, one reason was just, as you said, that I don't, I don't want the guy to get shot in the shoulder and then, three days later, he's okay. He doesn't even have, he's not even sore. It, I, it's just, never, that has always bothered me um, throughout TV and, and fiction as well. And so I wanted that to be, uh, you know, there, I, there's one book where he's got bruised ribs early and um, <laughs> trying to, when you're trying to put these things together, uh, fight scenes and such, bruised ribs early. And then, <laughs> Someone clips the end of his finger off with shear, with clipping shear or uh, gardening shears, and I'm and as I'm, I'm trying, to, as it's, as it's about to happen, he's got a twist, 
And so he's got a pain in his ribs, but then he lost the end of his fingertips. So I was judge like, how do we measure the pain here? But, you know, the uh, supremacy of pain. Um, it's just something I really wanted to stick to. Like I said, I broke the one rule and thank God that I did. But uh, I wanted these scars. I wanted all these scars to matter. And they certainly take their emotional skull scars until you got the CTE have been the more um, painful ones for him. But I just really wanted, it's an unreal world I'm writing in. If you looked at Rick's life from 30,000 feet, you go, nobody could live this way. He's been shot multiple times. He's been stabbed. He's um, multiple times. There's been a lot of things that have happened to him. And it's unrealistic. Well, there has to be repercussions for the things that do happen to him. And I try to make each individual book in Rick's um, damaged world that it makes sense for those two or those maybe up to a week of time in the life he lives, these things could really happen. And yes, the things carry over, but I, I try not to, th there are times when he'll take off his shirt or something. And then I'll think, Oh my God, let me see. I got it. Cause I don't have a Bible of all of his injuries or all that. So I got to think, Oh no, where, where's the scar from when he was shot in book two and when he was almost gutted, what side was that on? Um, it's always a challenge. So I do a lot of rereading on my earlier books, but it's just something I really, I, I'm happy and I'm glad you appreciate it. I'm something I'm, I'm happy. I stuck with, and I also was aging in real time. I wanted him to age in real time. He's got a dog now that's 13. Who's a, you know, probably more beloved than Rick will ever be and my readers. And he's 13. He's a big dog. He's a lab. He's 13. So his, I, I one rule I have is I, I, I think if the series continues, I would never, um, have midnight's life end on the page, but I could have him come back, the, the series come back where he's gone, and that would be um, difficult as a dog lover. Yeah, yeah, that that's I have a rule, man. Don't kill the dog. <laughs> no, don't kill the dog. But I, but it's like I said, it's real life. It's it's chronologically in real time, and midnight's thirteen, and he's a lab. That's pretty old for a lab. Thirteen, right. fourteen. Well, let's talk about Rick Cahill's character a little more because I've read, I read a lot of reviews prepping for this. And Hopefully not on Goodreads. <laughs> people seem to have an issue with Goodreads of late. No, I just, but you know, the, the professional reviews and reader reviews and that kind of thing. And, and something I saw a lot of was that people feel that Rick Cahill is genuinely a good guy, but not always one that is easy to like. Tell me about how you developed him and then how you evolved him over the course of this series. Yeah. Um, th and that, that kind of makes me happy because I figure that I'm doing what I'm trying to do if they not sure they can like him. Cause I, I, I've wanted him to be walking the edge at all times of like it, but you don't want to have your, if you're writing a series, you don't want to have your protagonist unlikable but I also, he's very damaged and he makes bad decisions at times. Um, but never without, it, it, he's, he, he's murdered people. He's flat out murdered somebody. Now these are bad people and he doesn't blow the smoke off the end of the gun and put it back in his holster after he kills somebody that he, he carries it with him. He starts to wonder if he's um, becoming the person he's trying to stop where he's making life and death decisions that are in his hands. Does he have the right to make these decisions? And he has made these decisions. So that's something I, he grapples with. Um, I did when I first started writing him and it took me a lot, as I told you, 10, 10 years to get published, much lighter, much lighter character. Uh, there's a writer here in San Diego named Alan Russell, who's a, a really good writer. Um, he's written plenty of mysteries. And he had the misfortune of reading an early draft at a writer's conference where you do the read and critiques. It might have been my first draft, which is really unfair to have anybody read that. First draft or first book. But he said, hey, there's good news you can write, but the, um, it's too autobiographical. And of course, every first book generally is, especially if you're writing a first person. So the more I advised, the more I got away from my own life and, and made Rick's life more dangerous. And what really changed things for me is... Um, uh, a line that came from my subconscious and during one of the revisions, which is the first time I saw her, she made me remember and she made me forget. And I realized there's been a lot of 
a pain in, in Rick's past. His backstory was full of a lot of pain. He was trying to find some light in his life, um, mostly unsuccessfully. And that really changed everything for me. Um, I still didn't really, I, as I wrote the first book, I didn't know all, I still, you know, I mean, pretty much now I got his backstory down, but I learned more with it, more about him as I wrote. And if a guy, he's got, well, the backstory of the first book, uh, Yesterday's Echo, was his wife was murdered. He was he was a cop in Santa Barbara. He was arrested for the murder, never tried, never exonerated for many years, thought to be a guy who murdered his wife. Uh, responsible or not, he feels responsible for actions he didn't and did take the night she died. He was supposed to be somewhere he wasn't. Um, so his whole, he's got, he's on a quest for redemption. And he takes cases where he gets too emotionally involved. He's trying to do... He's trying to do the right thing and he he can't because of for many years his wife's murder was um, unsolved he can't he needs to find the truth in the matter and he can't let evil stand and so that drives him to this manic need to find the truth just he has his own sense of justice his motto kind of is from his father sometimes you have to do what's right even when the law says it's wrong his, his own father had been a cop before him um so I think of a guy like that, he's probably somebody you want fighting for you, but maybe not somebody you want to have a beer with. So there is a delicate balance. And I do try. And, and the, I think if I had never introduced Moira, who I'd mentioned as a private detective as well, if somebody who's very capable that showing that she's, she, she cares for him. It's a, it's like a familial love at this point. If someone's because he's got his dog, but everybody knows you can be a jerk and your dog still loves you. Even, you know, even murderers, their dog loves them. But that's all he'd ever had. And, and then if someone so capable cares about him, then the reader might give him a, a more of a break. And he, he he internalizes a lot. And so you get you get a sense of why he's doing what he's doing. He knows at times he's doing the wrong thing, but he's doing it for sometimes you have to do what's right, even when the law says it's wrong. So he does. He, he, I don't think he'd like to have a beer with himself, but he kind of can't get out of his way in many ways. But um, he is in his own mind justified, but aren't we all? Right. You know, I've read a lot of novels, crime novels lately um, from writers who have a lot of experience writing for television or film. And, and as such, though, they tend to be maybe a little lighter. Uh, a little more like watching an episode of, you know, uh, Law and Order or NCIS or one of those, t you know, TV shows, which is perfectly fine. You know, they're very fast paced and and they're, you know, um, really good on that level. But they're not noir. They're not they're not the gritty kind of crime fiction that you write. Tell me a little bit about that philosophy behind. I guess the Rick Cahill series in general, but it just in noir more specifically, because there's a there's a real a, a real niche requirement with noir. You've got to be really good at it. There's there's stuff to it that's that really has to resonate to keep people, and you do it very very well. So maybe tell me a little bit about that. Well, thank you. Of course, um, I don't I. I read Chandler as a kid. Um, I read Ross McDonald. I read Dashiell Hammett, um, among others. Not just a hard-boiled noir, but that's that's in my blood. And I I think in terms of more, um, I mean, Otto Penzler will tell you exactly what noir means. And I'm not sure if I write noir, but I write hard-boiled. But yes, there's this undercurrent of um, darkness and um, something in the back. In the in the back the background something in the back story that is 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 hooked to this guy's belt buckles and then he can't escape and they carry it around. I think some people think of noir is that it's a much more um, kind of desolate where it's bad guys doing bad things and and I think you know it's it's um, broken people doing things and and. Um, not necessarily with bad intentions. And I know it's, it's a whole, I'm kind of going in the weeds here, but um, I just, I don't even think about genres when I'm writing. Uh, clearly I'm writing hard boiled noir. I'm writing it. It is what it is. 
I'm in first person. I'm in the guy's head. He probably thinks too much, but I, I, um, I wanted it to have everything, as I mentioned, matter. So there's carryover. I'm always really happy when reviewers say you can read as a standalone. I've been really lucky with reviewers saying that because that's something I really weigh quite a bit. How much am I giving away for new readers to kind of get the sense why this guy does what he does, but not boring old readers, but also not spoiling it. It's safe, say if someone buys book 10, they like it. I don't want them to know the entire backstory. They don't have to read the one through nine. Um, but it's funny you, you mentioned, um, What's the wolf? The wolf series you mentioned, um, the cop series. Um, oh, uh, Law and Order. Law and Order. I mean, it, those those are upside. So you've you've got you've got pretty much the the plot is the thing. The crime is the thing. You know a little bit about the protagonist's backstory, but that thing solved. We move to the next one. There's not much carryover. Sometimes there's a very special episode where it might go two episodes. You know, you'll learn a little bit more about their their lives, and I'm sure over. God, 30 years. I don't know how long that show's been on, but there's been, uh, um, I can't think of her name. She's got a very interesting name. She's been on for probably 25 years. So I'm sure we've learned more about her as we've gone along. But if you're writing in first person, and noir and it doesn't necessarily need to be written in first person, hard boiled generally is, but doesn't have to be. But you're, you know, you're learning, you're learning about why someone does something. And there, there are breaks in the action. There are certain breaks in the action. I don't think I write thrillers. Sometimes, you know, the, the publisher always like to have to say, it's a thriller. <laughs> I don't write thrillers, but um, everybody wants thriller on their book. But it's more of a, you know, it's a, it's a slower pace, but I'm also always happy when people say that it was, um, you know, it moved at a good pace. And I think a lot of that, is the because what I one thing I try to think about is um, change and tension on every page. You don't always get change, but pretty much just tension on every page. And tension makes you feel like things are going faster than they are. If whatever, even internal struggles that Rick is having, if, you, if the tension makes you, it feels like movement. So I don't have to have thirty shoot um, thirty shootouts in the book, but I can have a couple that mean something and also. Um, Rick's wife, I mean, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a family story, but family's important. Rick taking his daughter and leaving him. I mean, that's huge internal struggle. That's tension. Um, that's movement. You can't sit on it and overdo it. And that's a delicate balance as well. But that is movement. Uh, and so I think all that matters. Um, I know some great um, um, real thriller writers that show you emotion one being greg hurwitz i mean greg can really fast pace but he still shows you a lot of character um i write at a much slower pace but you know i try to the character is king for me and i that's that's where i start so many crime novelists are former cops or sometimes they're reporters who covered the crime beat or you know occasionally they're lawyers we've seen that a lot um I think, I believe you spent most of your uh, career in the corporate world. Um, how did you come to write such great noir crime fiction? Because, um, you know, cops can always lean on their history and things that they saw. Yeah. You know, what? How would? how was that for you? What was that transition like for you? I'm a former nothing. Um, however, my, there is law, there's, uh, law enforcement, in my family, my late brother-in-law was a cop for 33 years. My nephew, his son, gosh, he's probably been a cop now for 16 or 17 years. Um, the two daughters married cops. So there's a lot of cops in that side of the family. However, I really didn't lean on my brother-in-law gene too much. I just, I do remember, I do remember when he was his first or second year and he was, Gene was probably seven years older than me. He had to shoot and kill somebody um, in an alley. Um, and it, came, it was a righteous shooting. But and Gene was very, very close to the vest. But my sister Jan would say, yeah, he doesn't sleep. At he doesn't sleep anymore. It took him a long time to get over that. So I got the and I actually kind of used some of that in my uh, came about in my second book, Night Tremors. Um, so I got, I got that sense. And, and Gene it helped me with some nuts and bolts stuff. And, and there's a friend of mine, a writer. David Putnam, who helps me with a lot of cop stuff when I need it, who's been every kind of cop there is, David's been. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't, I don't, it probably is the reason I didn't 
choose to write police procedurals is because, well, first of all, I read, I mean, I wanted to write PI fiction, but police procedurals, I need to know more. I need to be really be on top of things. Rick, Rick was a cop. He needs to know police procedural, but it's not something he's, you know, it's not every day things I'm dealing with, but um, you know, I do, I do my research. I talk to people, but yeah, I don't, you know, I've got, I just, I, I start with the, I start with the subplot, the major subplot in Rick's life. What's he going through? And the major thing right now is he's going through this life of violence that's put him this, this situation with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But, um, you know, I try to get things right. I'm sure I get them wrong. Dave's told me when I've gotten some stuff wrong. I've gotten guns wrong. I got a gun I owned wrong one time, which I could not believe. I put the um, serial number in the wrong spot. And I, I, I had it and some writer, and, and it's always it's always great when you get a gun wrong because people say, you know, hey, I really love the book, but you go, oh, no, I screwed something up. Um, like the serial numbers, the serial number's not there. I'm going, what? So I went, pulled on my gun. <laughs> it was right. I hadn't shot or looked at it in years. And, um, you know, all I had to do was look. But anyway, um, so I, you know, you get things wrong and you just have to kind of live with it and you get them fixed on the Kindle version or the E version. <laughs> but um, I try to work with the emotion of the character and a little bit of osmosis through my brother-in-law and just knowing a few cops, but yeah, I don't, I can't write a police procedural. I don't know what, what it's really like, but I think as writers, our job is to take real emotion that we've experienced and put it into a fictional situation. I heard Jack Carr talk about it one time. Jack has lived these experiences, but he really, I can't, I wish I could remember exactly what he said, but so I'm of a certain age where there's been loss in my life and there's been young loss in my life that hurt my whole family. And so I know the pain of losing someone and, but I haven't watched a friend die in front of me, but I do, you know, I do know pain. I do know love. I do know love loss. So you take that real emotion. That's our job is to go find and dig that real emotion out and then make it realistic in, an, in a situation you've never been in. So hopefully I, I've done a pretty good job of that. You mentioned subplot. Um, I understand that you start with subplot, correct? I really do. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I have an idea for the story. I don't outline, uh, I, I, my um, first drafts get messier with each book. I, I like to call it organic because it sounds better. That's the, that's what we call our uh, blank pagers. But I do, I, I, I got this, I, I got an idea. I kind of know who the bad guy is. There's my target at the end. That's what I'm aiming for. But really what's the most important is what is going on in Rick's life. We're taking a case or the, not always, but this particular case where it'll make his life more difficult and probably making the case itself, um, you know, get bring it to fruition more difficult. So yeah, I always figure out, and, and that comes to me pretty quickly. It comes to me more quickly than the story does. Rick's major subplot in the last three books has been kind of easy. It's it's the CTE, but it's also the family life, which I never intended him to have. Never intended Rick to be a father or even get married again. But that the character grew, and I had to follow where he was going. I want to tell you a little bit about the business side of all this, because that that's the thing that's a tough one for, I think, so many writers. Um, there's a great new piece, actually, out I just read in Esquire, uh, about just how hard it is to make a living as an author. And and the reason I, I, I like to talk to writers about this, because I think there there's probably fewer today than maybe there used to be. But I think there was this, this fantasy that I think a lot of writers have. Oh, I write my book. I go out and quickly get an agent. I get the publishing deal. I'm on the Today Show. You know, <laughs> they pay me to, to to for my hotel and my travel and all these things, right? And it's 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 uh, it's world changing this this experience. Um, like I said, there's this great new piece in Esquire talking about you know, just how hard it is to make a living as an author, even when you're very very successful. Um, you noted it took you 10 years to get your, your first Cahill book out there. You, you're now on the 10th. Uh, clearly, you're not going to have problems getting the next one out, uh, whatever, wherever, you know, whether it's another Cahill or something new. How do you see the publishing industry right now in terms of what writers should expect going into it? Has it changed a lot since you first 
fact that got that first bit of success. Yeah, I think it's I think it's changed in that self publishing has become um, more prevalent, and some people are actually making good money self publishing. Um, and it's not; it's generally the people I know some some authors who were traditionally published with some big houses early. I know one author in particular; she wrote I think four books with uh, you know one of the top five publishers. And then she started self-publishing and she's making way more money than she was um, traditionally published. But it's there's also a lot of glut out there with people who, you know, the one thing about being traditionally published is you're betting, you're going through the process. It took me 10 years and thank God it took me 10 years. Thank God I got all those rejections because whatever level I'm at, I wouldn't be if I got something published earlier. I wouldn't have had to become a better writer. I wouldn't have had to write so much, you know, I mean, revise and revise and revise. Um, I think there's, it's, I, there's more opportunity, I think, to get published and not just even necessarily um, self-published because even with the consolidation, there's a lot of smaller imprint or not imprints, but publishers that have popped up. So, and some, a lot of them strictly online, you know, eBooks, e they can occasionally do a little print on demand, but so I think it's easier to get, at least not harder to get published as when I started, I think, but I think it's definitely harder to make money. I think it's absolutely definitely harder for any kind of mid lister to make a living, to make any money. Um, and you, what you said, you described exactly what I thought when I first started writing. I remember when I, I was, um, I worked for uh, four golf companies, all of which I helped put out of business in 10 years. They all went out of business and I, when I saw the handwriting on the wall for the, for the fourth one, and I said, this is it. I was 42 or three. And I said, I gotta, I gotta write this book, a book, or I can't pretend it's something I'm going to do. I always thought I was going to be a writer, but just didn't do it. So sure enough, company went out of business and I wrote every day um, at my kitchen table. And after about seven months, I'd written what I thought was a book because it said chapter one on the first page. And then the end, the last page said at the end, I thought I had a book. And I remember a week later, thank God, a guy I'd worked with in the golf business called me up and regarding his sports licensing company. He goes, hey, Matt, we need somebody to say all this. I said, well, you know, Eric, I just wrote my book. Uh, so, and I'm thinking in my head, you know, I'll get the agents, I'll sell the book, I'll buy the house in La Jolla. And uh, that'll probably take a year, maybe. You know, I mean, I was being conservative, so maybe a year. But I said, you know, I'll come over. I'll come over and help you out. So, you know, so I'll, do, I'll do it for you, Eric. And I worked there for 16 years, <laughs> but I did write five books while I was working full time. But yeah, that, that is the, that is the conceit. That is the misconception. Um, you know, and I still don't have that house in La Jolla after 10 books. Um, it is really hard to make money. There's a glut of, of books out there. Um, there's the, the, the kind of the, the treasure at the end of the rainbow is, you know, maybe you'll be able to get picked up for streaming or TV or something. And there certainly, although I think that's consolidating too, but there certainly are all, you know, all these sub genres and niches for what people want to watch is kind of being addressed in the marketplace and streaming, but it's hard to find them at times. And they're still, they're trying, I think the streaming thing, they're trying to figure it out over there too. Is you know, because I, I think there's COVID actually, I think kind of hurt them. I think they've got a glut of um inventory right now. And so they're trying to run through it and find try to find a way to make money as opposed to doing a lot of new stuff. I think I read an article on that too. Yeah, you know, I, I think um I think I was going to ask you, you know, what was the biggest surprise moment for you in all of this? And maybe, maybe that was it. Find, finding out that what your 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 fantasy image of all this was wasn't really going to work out. But was there anything else that was that took you back a, a step a little bit when you were doing that, good or bad? I would say that um, what surprised me is how much I would enjoy the interaction with readers because I kind of a I'm kind of a loner and you know public speaking is 
the idea of sitting and standing in front of, I was in sales, but that's kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing. And, but to stand in front of people and talk about your, your product, your story was, um, got wrenching for me in the beginning. It was kind of difficult, but now it's one of the favorite things I do is doing, um, events, book signings, conferences, all that sort of thing. Um, I got the opportunity to interview Michael Connolly just last week in front of 500 people. And sure, I was a little nervous in the beginning, but it was one of the, you know, it was a great time, great interview by Michael, of course. Um, so being getting better at it and looking forward to it and and really enjoying it, I think that surprised me. Um, learning that as a mid-lister, how much of your own marketing you have to do was a little bit of a, a um, unexpected, but, you know, that was book one. You figured that out. But, yeah, there, you're always, you know, I've got a publicist that I pay. She gives me deals, but um, to me, it's a lot of money. But um, so I'm always, you know. But beyond that and beyond the publisher, I'm doing my, I set up all my own book signings and things like that. So I'm, you're constantly marketing. Um, there's, I mean, the, the, it's a business and you need to treat it as such. It's not you just writing in, a, in your cocoon, which is what which was really fun when I first started doing it. No, there's a whole, you are a business and you have to treat it like a business. Definitely you have to treat it. And it's not, not just the writing part as a business, but all the other stuff. Right. So um, as a reader, you know, you always hear as a writer, you need to be a good reader too. How has, how, how have things changed for you as a reader? Uh, mm. Are you more of a forensic reader now? Because I think, mm. I know since I started writing, I can still read for pleasure and just let it go and, and not really pay that much attention to structure and all those things. But when I'm involved in something, I know that, I'm reading and I'm seeing, oh, that was interesting how they did it that way. Oh, okay. You know, this, that, and the other thing. And that that's, you know, that's just now how I read stuff. How was yeah. how that for you? Yeah, that, when I first started writing that, definitely reading changed. But you mentioned that you can kind of get away from it sometimes. I'm learning I can get away from it more and more. Um, I, there's always clicking in the back of your mind. Um, oh, that was an interesting choice, but... Not so it's become um, an assignment or, you know, I can do that better type of thing. It's um, it's always nice to read, read a story that's really well written. And you go, ah, God, this, this is why I started writing. And this is where I started, you know, this is why I enjoy reading. But it's, it's, it's never going to go away. But I do think I'm able to find the enjoyment part more. I think probably now be, because I, I don't get that much free time to 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 read for pleasure, we'll call it. There's a lot of uh, awards and things where you're judging and reading for a lot of blurbs and there's just things that come up, which is an always an honor. And people do the same for me. But you know, to be able, like when the Connolly, Crace, or T. Jefferson Parker book comes out, just to be able to like, I'm putting it all away. I'm just diving in the story. That's fun. And there's nobody that can build story like Connolly and I don't even know how he does I'm a, I'm a prof I don't get paid I get paid for writing I'm a professional I don't really know how he draws you in because there's, there's, like, there's no tricks no fireworks he just tells a story and in page three you're just I'm just in and I don't even know how I got there because mm -hmm. see he makes it so simple where I'm you know trying to maybe turn a phrase or something but just pulls you in and when you're in that situation I just go with the flow sure it's clicking back there oh did that but it's nice to be able to just let it go and and roll with it well i i would be terribly remiss if um if i didn't ask you since we we talked earlier about you know your main character has got a fatal disease how are how are we looking i mean are you are you prepared to say this is the last cahill novel or is that still to be determined and really the the, the bigger question here is are there a, is there another character or series that you've got in your head and you don't have to tell me specifics but you know what what are we looking at from from you from Matt Coyle in the future here I will say the readers can read Odyssey's end and side if it's the end for Rick on the page or off um 
I can't imagine not writing in Rick's world. I've been in there for 20 years, but I'm writing something different right now. I'm writing a, um, I'm writing a third person so far. I haven't done that since college. And that was a few decades ago. Um, probably going to have multiple points of view. It's uh, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a little bit of Rickish backstory to it. Former cop had to leave the forest. Only one, one person knows why his, his superior, his friend, and he's, you got to go and we won't, we won't tell anybody what happened. Um, his father was a cop for him. He's ill. Brick's helping with the bills, but as, as a private investigator, he's not making the money he needs to. So he's got a chance to pick up a short term gig for a um, public defender's office where he's working for the other side. And he's a true believer. Rick's a true believer in the, on the one side of the thin blue line. And he ends up working with, a, a woman PD uh, public defender who is a true believer on the other side. So there's a built in tension there and which I really like, and there's respect as well, but his father just cannot get over the fact that he crossed the line. And um, so I've got and I, the story. I won't really get into too much. I'm still working my th way through it. I'm kind of waiting my way through. It's I, as I mentioned to you uh, earlier that, everything starts with the Rick backstory or, or the Rick um, subplot. Well, I don't have Rick right now. So I'm, and I'm not in anybody. I mean, I'm third person. I'm pretty close third person, but I'm kind of bumping around in the night, but that in the dark, but that's okay. That's the way I always write. Um, I just usually can tell a little flashlight with me. I don't have it right now, but I'll find my way. It's going to take me a little longer than I, than I hope, honestly. So I, I don't believe I'll have a book out next year, but I hope to, um have one out in 25. well that's fabulous i'm sure there are many of your fans who are anxious to see what kind of new adventures and characters you come up with here that all sounds really interesting um i always like to end the show on something uh, that i hope is the fun question i mean for it to be a fun question uh, i'm going to put on my hat of omnipotence and say i can mm -hmm. put you together with one of the following three people mm -hmm. or whatever to hang out with, have a drink, have dinner, talk shop, whatever. The options, and I, I try to have a theme here. And I'll see if, if you recognize the theme. I'm guessing you will get it pretty quickly. But the, the options I'm going to give you are um, uh, the great Ted Williams, who mm -hmm. regular viewers of the show will see my Ted Williams uh, poster on the wall back there. San Diego. Uh, yes. Ted Danson. Or... Theodore Geisel, who most people know better as Dr. Seuss. Oh, wow. I can put wow. you together with one of them. There's actually two themes there, but but um, who would you choose and why? Ted Williams, Ted Danson, or Theodore Geisel? It's definitely between uh, Dr. Seuss and Ted uh, Williams. Um, Ted, I'm of a certain age. I never saw Ted Williams play, obviously, but um, he is a San Diego icon, and his relationship with Tony Gwynn, um, who beloved in this town and was, I think my age or a year younger. And I met him a few times when I was in the golf business and charity work he did just a great human being and losing him. I still, that still bothers me losing him so young for, for those of us that are getting older. So the relationship he and Ted Williams had is very special. Um, but Ted, I think that Dr. Seuss, Ted Geisel, was a genius. I think that what he did with children's books was unbelievable. And there's the Geisel Geisel Library up at UCSD where I actually, there's a tie-in, when I was writing out of college, some horrible book that, thank God, never went anywhere, um, I would go up there and, and write. So, man, I'm a huge sports fan, too. <sighs> I'd probably go with uh, I'd probably go with Doctor Seuss. Yeah, awesome. Well, are you, you probably figured it out. There are three, in a way, three Ted's. Well, I got that part. Three are San Diegans, and uh, take us to Ted Dan Danson. Born in San Diego as well. I did not know that. All three San Diegans and uh, San Diego. By the way, one. If you have never been to San Diego. Greatest city in the world that has the worst airport in the world. But I, I hate the San Diego airport, but I absolutely love San Diego. My you pretty much summed it up. It's a horror. We're the eighth largest city in the world. We have a minor league airport. Yeah, it's a, it's a tragedy. But uh, but yes, I, I, I and, and I, and I want to concur with you about Tony Gwynn. I, I started out in sports. As regular viewers know, listeners know, I'm a, 
I'm a reporter. I cover politics. But many, many decades ago when I started all this, I was a sports reporter and I had the opportunity to, to do a fairly lengthy sit down with Tony Gwynn one time. One of my two favorite people I have ever encountered in sports, because some of them are really on my unfavorites list. But yeah. but, uh, yeah. but Dusty Baker and Tony Gwynn hold a very, yeah. very special place in my heart. Tony was one of the most gracious, f- fun, interesting, smart, great sense of humor. Uh, yeah, great laugh. I can- cannot say enough good things a- about about Tony Gwynn. And that's aside from the fact that he was w- one of the greatest hitters that it's ever existed huge Certainly. baseball guy you might guess from how i'm talking about him i was a huge baseball yeah. guy so anyway yeah. uh, good choice though dr seuss i mean that's uh, i don't think i've offered that to anyone before so so you get to be the first person who chose dr seuss but hey I, you, you, I can't think of too many people who changed you know influenced more people than than dr seuss so yeah there you go i well, met his wife at a uh there was art um there was used to be a a um museum not a museum but a gallery in saying down in la jolla that's not there anymore but they had the whole they, for a while they had the the dr seuss art and his his second wife the one he lived with when he passed was there and um she looked so much like the char- the characters they end up drawing it was amazing it was amazing <laughs> it's really amazing okay. but uh not, yeah dr seuss but um I was a huge Cheers fan too. So um, Ted Danson, I'm, I you you gave me some trivia. I did not know. That's interesting about San Diego. Did not know that. Well, you know, I have my my work here is done, people. <laughs> well, actually, my work here is done. I want to thank Matt Coyle for coming on. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab another copy of the book if you haven't seen it yet. It comes out today, November 14th. Now again, you're you're watching or listening to this uh, after that, but. Um, and by the way, it's just one of these things to note. When you see a book in hardcover, I got to tell you how hard it is to get books in hardcover in this day and age. You have to have done something. So this is just, this is an accomplishment. So great job there. Thank you. Um, really appreciate you. you coming on, sharing insights into uh, Rick Cahill and to publishing and and into your processes. Uh, I know it's going to be really helpful for anybody that uh, is an aspiring author out there. Uh, one thing we didn't even talk about, we actually have the same literary agency. You, you, uh, you're you with Kim, Kimberly Cameron, right? Absolutely. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wonderful so I, human I, being, too. Speaking yeah, of. yeah, yeah. Great. I, she's not my particular agent, but but uh, my agent is with her agency. So that's that's awesome. Well, I know some of the agents are all good people. Yeah. Great, great folks. So uh, we'll hopefully someday we'll, we'll we'll have another we'll have a chance to chat about that. But uh, in the meantime, I'll remind everybody, if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe. Uh, and if you're able to, please leave me a nice review. It really does help other people find the show. And I can tell you, if if you're an aspiring writer or you know someone who is, I like to think this show could be really helpful uh, with anybody who's trying to learn about the ins and outs of the business and how these great, very talented folks do what they do. As you heard, it's not an easy path for anybody. So every little bit of uh, insight you get might be that nugget that turns your writing career around. So do me a solid. Hit subscribe. Leave a nice review. Help somebody else find the show. Um, And so with that, I will leave you with the other thing I always leave you with, and it comes from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So please make today count. Um, For myself, Rich Eisen, for my guest, Matt Coyle, this has been The Open Mic. I'll see you next time. Take care. (laughs) 